So let me first begin with uh, the ancient Sanskrit chant, which is always chanted before satsangs. Um, unfortunately, I know many of you may know the chant, but the situation in the modern world is such that people chant but do not understand what is being chanted. So, one of the things I am trying to do is try and introduce the teaching of Sanskrit in as many universities as possible. It's actually quite shocking that if you go to Berlin, the university has three chairs in Sanskrit. We don't have one chair in India, except in the Banaras Hindu University and the Sanskrit Vidyalaya. So this is very important because it's the language which is the root of the Indian culture itself. Anyway, so let me chant and then I will explain and then we will go forward. If you can't hear, please tell me. It is important that I convey my thoughts to you. The first chant is from the Vedas, from the Upanishads. It's a beautiful chant which we will explain. Today's satsang would be wisdom of the rishis, not my wisdom. Huh? So, the first chant is Om Purnamada, you don't have to say, Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamaduchyate, Purnasya Purnamataya Purnameva Vashishyate, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Second chant, Brahmanandam Paramasugadam Kevalam Jnanamurtim Dvandvatitam Gagana Sadarsham Tattvamasyati Lakshyam Ekam Nityam Vimalam Achalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavatitam Trigunarahitam Sadgurum Thamnamami This is going down to my master, to my guru, my Swarnath Babaji. And the last one, we will begin our uh, satsang with this. Om. You must have heard, it's very common. Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvinavati Tamastuma Vidvishavahai. This is the chant. Now, listen to this carefully. Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai. Would you see a common word in all the three lines? What? Saha. So, Sahana Vavatu, may you and I be protected. I am deliberately using you and I, not I and you. May the listener as well as the speaker be protected. Protected from what? Protected from all disturbances. Protected from external uh, problems that happen like rain and thunder and lightning and cyclones and whatever. And also internally from all disturbances that takes the mind away from being able to fix itself in attention. All this protection is sought not only for me but also for you. So what I'm trying to say, the word Saha shows an equal sharing between the teacher and the taught. It's not as if the teacher is more important than the taught. Eh? Because the essence of the Upanishadic knowledge is that the spark of the divine is in you. It, it's also in me. Therefore, in one sense, whether you have found it or not, we are on the same footing. If you haven't found it, I have seen it. So it's okay, we are on the same footing. So all human beings, are walking, breathing, moving temples of the Supreme Being. Therefore, kindness to human beings is something that has been taught beautifully in the Gita. We'll get to that slowly. So, Sahana Vavatu, may we be protected. Sahana Bhunaktu, may we be nourished. Nourishment, not only food, which is physical nourishment, but nourishment in knowledge, nourishment of understanding, the food that is required to go into deeper levels of consciousness. 
So you can call it food for thought if you like. Hmm? Then, saha viryam karavavai, virya is virility, energy, the capacity to work, the capacity to think, the capacity to stay with full energy is virility, virya. So may my virya and may your virya be awakened. You see, the study of the deeper aspects of Hindu system of thought requires a lot of energy. It's, it's not done after retirement. It's something to start from the beginning when you're very young. So, may the virility in you and I increase. Then, Tejas Vinavadi Tamastu, may the Tejas, the light of spiritual illumination, shine forth in both of us. Mm, last one is very interesting. Ma Vidvisha Bhai, let's not fight with each other. Because when a satsang, he, if you ask a question, you know, if we discuss it, it's a, it's a, a dialogue. It's not an argument. Uh, the, please differentiate between an argument and a dialogue. A dialogue is when two of us are sitting together trying to find something. An argument is when you have decided that you are right and I have decided that I am right and both of us are clashing. This is an argument. So, the prescription is somewhat. You know those who have read the Gita, for instance. The Bhagavad Gita is one continuous samvad. In fact, the description of the Gita itself, at the end of each chapter of the Gita, the great Vedvyas has put in one sentence. One, it is Srimad Bhagavad Gita, so this you can understand. At least to people who know all Indian languages can understand. It is Srimad Bhagavad Gita, so this is the Bhagavad Gita. And what is it about? Upanishads. It is the essence of the Upanishads. And what does the Upanishad teach? Brahma Vidyaya, the knowledge of the Supreme Brahman. Then there is one word, Yoga Shastra. Yoga Shastra is that which is used to prepare the mind to understand the deeper mysteries of life. Without Yoga Shastra, the mind is too dull and too insensitive to understand the deeper aspects of spiritual knowledge. So, Yoga Shastra is included. Then, Sri Krishna Arjuna Samvade. A Samvad between Krishna and Arjuna. So, it's a Samvad. So, therefore, when the mantra says, Ma Vidvisha Bhai, it means have a debate, have a dialogue. Don't quarrel, don't argue. They are two different things, right? Now, the, the other mantra, Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamaduchyate, Purnasya, Purnamataya, Purnameva, Vashishyate, come from the Upanishad. Now, you must have seen the notice today, wisdom of the Rishis. Now, the wisdom of the Rishis, first let me start from the beginning. The ancient Indian teachings of philosophy, spirituality and religion start with the four Vedas. I am sure many of you know, I'm, it's good to know that actually once upon a time the Vedas were just the intuitory experiences of great rishis which were not codified and put into any particular order. They were everywhere floating around. The great Veda Vyasa. In fact, the word Vyasa in Sanskrit means a compiler. It's called Veda Vyasa because he compiled the Vedas. So it was Veda Vyasa who brought all the Vedic knowledge that was scattered, divided them into four, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atharvana Veda. So these are the four Vedas. Now what happens is, generally, when people say Vedas, they think only of the Samhitas, chantings, like the Rig Veda Samhita, the Yajur Veda Samhita. The Rig Veda Samhita has the most important mantra that has been taught to us. Most important mantra. What is that? 
Vishwamitra is the Rishi and the mantra is Gayatri. This occurs in the Rig Veda and it is sung in, in a certain chandas, which means a certain way it has to be sung. You can't fix the Gayatri mantra in the reverse sound for your car. It defeats its purpose. And Gayatri is to be chanted, not sung. Today there are many songs. How is the Gayatri? It is chanted and it is usually chanted silently. This is the Gayatri. So I am saying, so many important mantras occur in the way the Samhitas. Now that these are the Samhitas. After the Samhita portion, which is also included in the Vedas, are the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are that part of the Vedas which describe the ceremonials, how to do a prana pradishta, how to establish a temple, what to do, what are the mantras used for good, for bad, for everything. These are the Brahmanas. And the next section are called the Aranyakas. Now the Aranyakas are that part of the Vedas which were taught in the forest. What is an Aranya? It's a forest. So, this is when people studied the rest and then wanted to seriously inquire into the essence. So they went off in quiet places in the Aranyakas and studied them. Now, this is the Aranyaka portion. From the Aranyaka to the last part, which is Upanishad, is a silent shift. Many of the Upanishads are Aranyakas, that which were studied in the forest. And the Upanishads are the essence of the Vedas. You know, in, in the Vedas, there are four important uh, words which are called Mahavakyas. Rig Veda, Ajur Veda, Sama Veda, Atharvana Veda. There are the four Mahavakyas, the great words. And what are the Mahavakyas? One, I am Atma Brahma. My Atman is Brahman. Hmm? Then, Prajnanam Brahma. The Supreme Being is light, illuminated, and conscious. Prajna. Prajnanam Brahma. Tatvamasi, you are that, you are not different from that, you are a part of that Supreme Being. And last one, it's a dangerous word to say because some people think of the body when they say it, which is not true. Am Brahmasmi, I am the Brahman. Now if you begin to think that you are the Brahman, it probably builds up your ego and becomes very fat. So it has a different meaning. We will not go into it right now. I would prefer to say I am a part of the Brahman or something rather than I am the Brahman. <laughs> well, Ramanujacharya, the founder of Vishishta Advaita, taught it very nicely. He said, when it says Aham Brahmashmi, it simply means water is H2O everywhere. Water in the sea, water in the river, water in the little gutter, it's still water. Chemically, yes. But quantitatively and qualitatively, it may not be the same in the sense the sea and the river is water. You can run a ship on it, right? A bowl which is kept on the table also contains water, but you cannot run the ship on it. That is the difference between the Paramatman and the Jivatma. Yourself and the Supreme Self. Perhaps when all differences are removed, it may appear to be the same, but I would still say a reflection. Let me stay there. Okay. Now, these are the Upanishads. So what do the Upanishads teach? They explain the Mahavakyas. They explain in detail what the Mahavakyas have said. Now, therefore, well, this is not a class on Bhakti Yoga, so I'm not going into that. That's a completely different chapter altogether. <laughs> we would require several satsangs to do that. So let me go into the understanding of the Upanishads. If you really are serious about Bhakti Yoga, there, are, there is a wonderful text that you should study, which is the Narada Bhakti Sutras. There's no better text to study about Bhakti Yoga. And also I will deal with the chapter in the Bhagavad Gita called Bhakti Yoga. 
which is chapter 12. Okay. So now let's proceed. Now what are the Upanishads? They are the essence of the Vedas. The essence, the greatest teachings that have come to us from the ancients are the Upanishads. And what are the Upanishads? Look at the word. Unfortunately, Sanskrit is at a pre premium. Upanishad is made of three syllables. The first one is Upa. Second one is Ni. And the third one is Shat. So, what does Upa mean? Upa means to move close, to come together, to move closer, which means to move closer to the truth. Somewhere along the line, I tell people, when you go too close to the truth, you don't remain. There is only the truth. You're gone. So, anyway, it's like going near the sun, you're burnt. Or Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said, it's like the salt doll trying to measure the depth of the ocean. You go inside to measure, there is no salt doll, there is only the ocean. Right? So, in the same way, Upa means to move closer. It also means that it's a knowledge that is imparted face to face, close to each other. Therefore, it's called Shruti. Now, Shruti means that which is heard, not which is written and studied, interpreted by heart. No, heard. So, when the teacher, the Rishi said something, and when the student with an open mind listened to it, immediately it registered. Now, this can be done only close to each other. Remember, those days there are no loudspeakers and microphones also. And it was also called Rahasya because it was usually taught in secret in the forest universities. Why? Because it is more powerful than nuclear physics. Can you imagine broadcasting how to make an atom bomb to the public? What will happen? The whole world will be destroyed. So, these are, wonder these are not empty words. These are wonderful things, the essence of energy which is being studied. So it was always done in close quarters. It also means, not physically close, physically last two and a half years we couldn't get too close because of COVID. The minds have to be close to each other. See what happens, I have seen this with my master Maheshwarnath Babaji. Oh, you study, when the mind gets close, what is there is transferred into the other mind. This is the real meaning of Shakti Pad. Not that somebody is doing it. It means when two minds are vibrating at the same frequency, which means they are close to each other, the knowledge here is automatically transferred to the other. Even without words, many a time. So this is close, Upanishad. Not C-L-O-S-E, close, not close, but move closer. You have heard of Upavasa. What is Upavasa? People think usually fasting. Good only for health, all that is fine. But Upavasa, what is Vasa? To move towards, to visit, right? What is Upa? Close. That means to move towards closeness to the divine is Upavasa. That's why I'm saying please study Sanskrit. So, now, <clears throat> this is Upa. Then I leave the knee word for the time being and go to the last, Shad. Shad means to sit. Literally it means sit. Now you're sitting here and one of you stands up. I know that you don't want to listen, right? So sitting is one condition for you to sit and listen. But it is not enough if your body sits. Mind also has to sit. You can sit here, but your thought could be somewhere else. It's a Sunday, you know. So it could be somewhere else. So sitting here, Shad means, you are not only physically here, but your mind is also sitting here. It stopped moving. If it completely stops moving, you've got it. You don't have to study anything else. But it means to sit quietly and listen and move closer to the spiritual essence, Upanishad. Adi Shankara was 
one of the first commentators on the Upanishads, especially the eleven principal Upanishads. And he said, there is another meaning, Sanskrit, each word has numerous meanings. He being a great grammarian, picked up one other meaning of shad, which means to shake up. What is the meaning of shaking up? Shaking, he's, according to Shankara's commentary on the Upanishad, Shad is the shaking up of the human being from the sleep of ignorance towards the awakening of wisdom. Awakening of wisdom. This shaking up is required. It also means to put someone thinking in a different form altogether. See, normally we are thinking this way, and here the thinking is this way, it's upside down, to shake up one's thoughts and make them, because these are things which cannot be captured by words. The Upanishad itself says, yad vaja na bhutitam, that which words cannot capture. We are talking about an infinite entity, right? So therefore, the ordinary logic that to find that I must go from here to there has to vanish. This is also shaking up. You know that many of you may know, may be chanting the 15th chapter of the Gita, Purushottama Yoga. How does it start? Urdhavulam matashyakam mashvatham pravara. There is an upside down people tree. You have never seen such a people tree anywhere. All people trees grow with the roots down and branch. Here is a people tree whose roots are up and branches below. Is this possible? Which means you are putting your logic topsy-turvy and looking at the essence rather than the outer. Yes? Which also means that ordinary logic cannot understand it. Ordinary logic can conclude that it cannot understand and therefore find other ways of finding it. So, this shaking up also is shat. To say that I may not, I am not always 100% perfect in my logic. Because the logic is quite limited. My rational, see we always say, oh I have a rational framework. Right? This is good, good to have a rational framework. What is this rational framework that I have? How is it created? What is the data based on which I create my rational framework? My sense organs? We all have five sense organs. I hope you know that. Panchindriyas. The eyes to see, the ear to hear, the nose to smell, the hand to touch, and huh? the tongue to taste. Most important. Most people live by the tongue. Two ways, one by talking, the other by tasting food. <laughs> so, in fact, it's, the tongue is the greatest creative thing, it is also the greatest mischief maker, uh, in many ways, including food. You eat the tastiest food, generally you will fall sick, unfortunately, anyway. So when I go to Gujarat, I am very careful, too much food, good food. <laughs> I must tell you this. We had a padyatra from Kanyakumari to Kashmir. We were literally on the streets, on the roads, for how many months? One year and three months in India. Kanyakumari to Srinagar, which happened in spite of people saying, oh, they're going to kill you. I said, okay, doesn't matter, we'll go. And oh, why I'm saying this is about the tongue, you know. The Padyatris were strictly instructed to be moderate in their eating habits and so on and so forth, so we started off. Everybody lost weight till we reached Gujarat. <laughs> <laughs> Once we came out of Gujarat, all of us were two kgs extra. Because people feed you, you know, the food is also very tasty with everything there is ghee even in the khichdi, so. And then again we lost our weight. <laughs> And then we entered Punjab and again came away. <laughs> so the tongue, you see, how, what the tongue can do, that's what I'm trying to say. So anyway, so these are the five senses. Do you think there are any other senses, anybody here? Apart from the five senses? 
not normally we don't know of any. There may be six senses, but we are not discussing that. Generally, we have only five senses. And the idea, the rational framework that we create is based on the experiences of the five senses. Right? I'm teaching you the Upanishad. Five senses. Now, how reliable are these senses of ours with which we have formed this rational framework, blueprint? They're not reliable at all. Right? And every morning we see the sunrise. Every evening we see the sunset. You ask any high school boy, he will tell you that the sun neither rises nor sets. It's the world, that earth that is moving. But what do we see? What does our chakshu, eyes show that it is rising and it is setting? How much can you trust the data of the senses? Right? The most tastiest food can be kept before you. If you have jaundice, it has no taste. Is it the food's fault or your sensory organ's fault? And so on. I don't want to go into it. It would take a whole day. But if you study the Sankhya Paravanchana Sutra, you will understand that all that you know about the world is what is projected to you through your five senses. You really don't know what it is. And based on these imperfect inputs and data, we create a rational framework and we say, I am going to stick to this. This is my rational framework. So when the Upanishad says, shake up, means shake up your thought process. Okay, one more example before we proceed. Suppose what we are seeking is there, where he is sitting. And I am here and I want to find it. What happens if what I am seeking is here, there and everywhere? What do I do? Maybe when all movement stops, I might be finding it. So, all they are trying to say is that there is a different way of thought. There is a different way of thinking. It's not the same. You need to change. So, this is the Upanishad. So, you can understand how deep the Upanishads are. Now, there are over a hundred Upanishads. Among them, the principal Upanishads are only eleven. All the great Acharyas have commented on it. Shankara was perhaps the first, although there seem to be other commentators because he keeps criticizing previous commentators about whom we don't know in his commentary. But mainly Shankara. Then Ramanuja Acharya of the Sri Vaishnava teaching, he also commented on the principal Upanishads. Madhva, who was a dualist, Dvaita, he also commented on the Upanishads. So therefore, these eleven Upanishads are considered to be the most important Upanishads. I don't want to give you a list, but popular Upanishads like Katha Upanishad, uh, Mandukya Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, each Upanishad will take seven days minimum to finish. It's like a Saptah, I'd say. It's in depth. Let's not get into this right now. These are the Upanishads. Now, I'm connecting it to the Gita in some way. The Bhagavad Gita, as Vyasa himself says, is an Upanishad. Viti Srimad Bhagavad Gita, so Upanishad, so Brahma Vidyaya. Krishna's words, Sri Bhagavan Huacha. Now, the twelfth chapter, I said I will deal a little bit with Bhakti, so I'm coming to the twelfth chapter. Twelfth chapter of the Gita is called Bhakti Yoga. So several people, when I go for my satsang there, why didn't Krishna say that in the beginning? I mean, why go to the twelfth chapter? It would have been more easy for us. Huh? Plus, note that the first chapter is called Arjuna Vishada Yoga. What is the meaning of Vishada? Vishada, huh? sorrow, insecurity, uncertainty, fear of failure. In Sanskrit is a language, one word will have multiple meaning. You take the word Padma, it has 18 words to describe, including Kamala and so on. So, Vishada means sorrow, pain, problems insecurity, uncertainty, all this is vishada. So therefore, 
the actual study of the Gita begins when we are in Vishada mood. Otherwise, you know, when we are happy, everything is okay. Sunday you have a beer, everything is fine. Nobody thinks of Gita, religion, nothing. Guru Nanak said that beautifully in the Granth. He said, Dukhme sumiran sabh kare, sukhme kare na koi. It's only when something hits you badly, then you begin to simran. You begin to think of the Lord, search for, you know. But then when you're okay, it goes off. Yeah. So, with that, Arjuna is facing sorrow. I say that all of us are in the same seat as Arjuna in Vishada. And then begins the Gita. And Sri Bhagavan Vacha, then Krishna talks and says this, this, this. Okay. Now, there's another interesting aspect to this. Sanjay, the guy who is actually reciting the Gita to the blind king. So, Dhridarashtra is asking Sanjay, Dharma Kshetre, Guru Kshetre, Samveda Yutsava, Vamakam, Pandavasche, Kim Kurvate Sanjaya. He's asking Sanjaya, who is sitting in the palace, not in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Sanjaya, tell me what is happening between our people. You st- remember what words he's saying between us and the Pandavas. That means he's thinking of the Kauravas. He's not so worried about the Pandavas. What is happening? Please tell me. And Sanjay is sitting in the palace with a remote control TV or something and describing the whole Kurukshetra. Did they have a TV or did they have a, what did they have? Something was there. So, Sanjay is describing the entire battle of Kurukshetra. So, first chapter is Arjuna Vishada Yoga. Arjuna says, I am not going to fight. I am going to run away. Because I don't have a relative standing on the other side. Krishna says to him, hey, what happened to you, man? He puts down his bow. Krishna says to him, listen, you think that you are doing it because you are justified in doing it because there are relatives there. Actually, it's your fear of failure that is making you do this. Pick up your bow. Man. It's interesting. He says, pick up your bow. Fight. Because you, you are not fighting for yourself. You are fighting to save the righteous and to defeat the unrighteous. Here, there is no relative, non-relative, nobody. It's basically between righteousness and unrighteousness. Pick up your bow. What has happened to you? And it proceeds. Why I'm saying this is when sorrow hits one, then one begins to think of deeper spiritual things. So should we wait for that? Shouldn't we do it before? Why should we wait for sorrow to come? Now there is an extreme case here. Please, we cannot imitate. Please don't try to imitate, but it's not going to succeed. You'll run for your lives when it happens. And this is the great words of Kunti. You know who Kunti is? She is the matriarch of the family. So Krishna is leaving uh, for Dwaraka. Battle is over. Kurukshetra is over. Krishna is saying, going back to Dwaraka. So he goes and takes permission from everybody. Those who are his own age, he hugs them. And those who are elders, he take the dust of their feet. Krishna. And Krishna is depicted as a Purna avatara who is ready to bow down to the elders and touch their feet. Can you believe this? Which is why he is an avatara. Anyway. Uh, here, even if you are a little bit on a higher status, we don't want to touch anybody. Not possible. What if my boss sees me doing this? Huh? So, anyway. So, <coughs> He goes to Kunti, who is a matriarch, touches her feet and says, Kunti, I am going to Dwarka. Ask me for any boon you want. I will give it to you. Now is the right time afterwards. I will go up to Dwarka. There is a beautiful dialogue in the Bhagavad of Kunti telling Krishna. She says, say, listen here. Don't fool me now, please. I know your drama, I know who you are, I know everything. You are saying you are going to Dwarka, you go, don't go anywhere, you are all pervading. Where are you going? You are not going anywhere. So don't try this drama on me, I know you pretty well. 
But since you have asked for boon, I have one boon to ask you. Don't hesitate, give it to me. What is that boon? She says, bring the sorrows of the whole world on my head. Can you imagine? Who will ask? Usually we go to God and ask, I need a promotion. Huh? Bring the sorrows of the whole world on my head. Krishna himself is startled. What is this prayer? He says, because when sorrow comes, I will call your name for help. And I know that you will appear. So every time a sorrow comes, I call you and your blessed face appears before me. What more do I want? I keep seeing you all the time. Bring all the sorrows in the world. Krishna hesitates for a moment and then says, Tathastu, so be it, and goes to Dwaraka. Now this is bhakti, para-bhakti, where you want nothing but that. All other bhaktis are okay, but they are different steps, different stages. So anyway, so it starts with that, then there is karma yoga, I'm sorry, there is sankhya yoga, karma yoga, and so on and so forth, dhyana yoga, and then it comes to, please note, the tenth chapter. Till the ninth chapter, Krishna and Arjuna are on an equal basis, almost. They're sitting and talking to each other happily, their relatives, their friends, they're almost the same age. Krishna is, Arjuna asking questions, Krishna answering them, it's going on, normal. Then what happens in the 10th chapter? In the 10th chapter, suddenly Krishna is talking something which Arjuna can't understand. He says, among the mountains I am the Meru, among the immovables I am the Himalaya, among the Munis I am Kapila, and so on and so forth. And Arjuna is wondering, what is this? Till now we were talking on equal terms. And now this guy suddenly says, I am the Meru, and I am the Himalaya, and I am the Kapila. Either he's gone, he didn't say that, I'm saying, or what's wrong with this guy? Now what happens? So then what happens? His ordinary logic is being given a nice shake up. He begins to say, this is not the guy I thought he was, it's something else. So all my logic about him is gone completely. My rational understanding of Krishna is over, right? And what is the next chapter, 11th chapter? Vishwa Rupa Darsana. Suddenly Arjuna sees there is no Krishna sitting here. The, all the gods are here, everything is happening. It's like an atom bomb explosion happening. So his, finally, his so-called ordinary logic an ordinary rational thought is completely shattered to pieces. Then begins Bhakti Yoga, 12th chapter. So if somebody wants to go there, one needs to first finish off all these things. Because here we come to a world which does not fit into our ordinary rational systems. It's the heart to heart business, not brain to brain business. So therefore the 12th chapter. And it is interesting to note the question that Arjuna asks to Krishna in the 12th chapter is very interesting. Most chapters in the Gita start with Sri Bhagavan Vacha. There are few chapters like the 12th which starts with Arjuna Vacha. Arjuna asks. And what does Arjuna ask? He says, some people say, that the supreme being should be worshipped as the supreme Brahman without form, etc., etc. Are they the greater yogis? Or some people say you should be worshipped in a form like you are sitting before me uh, with a name and a rupa. They say they are the greatest yogis. So who actually are the greatest bhaktas? Huh? The one who worships the supreme formless or the one who worships form? Who do you say? Because if you say, I will accept it. Tell me. And Krishna goes about it in a beautiful way. As usual, indirect. You know, Krishna's adventures, they're all indirect. When something terrible is happening, he smiles. Anyway, so he 
says, listen, Arjuna, all human beings, all of us, live by na- not us, I mean not including Krishna, <laughs> all of us, live by name and form. In um, Upanishadic and Sankhya terminology, Nama Rupa. We all have Namas, names. Actually, name is a derivation from Nama. You just take the A and put E here at the end, name. So anyway, so Nama Rupa. Rupa, you know, form. So if I know your name, then I immediately your form comes to my mind. Or I see your form and your name comes to my mind. This is how we live in this world. Yes or no? All of us. How fond we are of our own rupas, right? Aren't we? And how can we go beyond rupas? It's not easy. Krishna says, look, it's not easy. Any proof do you want, anybody wants, that we are not fond of our rupas? Early morning, as soon as we wake up, what do we do? At the wash basin, look at the mirror. We had just grown little, let me shave. Hmm? Eyebrows, well, men don't do. Have grown too much, pluck them. Mm. Uh, you look at our face, oh, more wrinkles have come. So let's go and look at YouTube. There may be something to escape wrinkles. Form, we love our forms. Rupas and Namas. Can you imagine in a public place you go and somebody calls you by the wrong name? How do you feel? So we are the entire world. Somebody told me that he doesn't believe in idol worship. I said, lovely, wonderful, great man. You must be a great rishi. You worship the Brahman. And then I go to his house for lunch. All the walls are full of pictures of Amitabh Bachchan. I said, you are a matinee idol worshipper, I think. Maybe not a... Idol worship. So we all love our forms and names, right? So, Krishna says to Arjuna, therefore for most of us it's good to have a name and a form to enter the portals of spiritual practice. However, there were great rishis, of course, who worshipped the Supreme Being as the Supreme Brahman without form, even without bhava. Pramanandam, Paramasugadam, Kevalam, Yanamurtim, Dvandvaditam, Gagana Sadarsham, Tattvamasyadi Lakshyam, Ekam, Nityam, Vimalam, Achalam, Sarvadi, Sakshi Bhutam, and so on. But everybody cannot do that. It's better to go this way. However, whichever way you look at the Supreme, the modus operandi of how you worship is not important. The feeling and the heart are most important. So Krishna says, according to me, a person who calls himself a bhakta, yaha bhakta same priya, is the word used, has to have three attributes. One attribute, first attribute, samniyam indraya gramam. He should have control over his emotions and senses of the indriyas. That one I would consider to be a great bhakta, who has control over his samnyam indriya gramam. All the indriyas can be concentrated and controlled by him. One qualification. Ya bhakta same priya. Two, sarvatra sama buddhaya. Who has, who is tranquil under all circumstances. We cannot be agitated in any way. Tranquil under all circumstances. Sarvatra, at all times. Sama, equal buddhaya. The mind is equal at all times. Neither attracted nor repulsed. Neither angry nor... So, two qualifications. And the third, Sarva Bhuta Hite Rata. One who has the welfare of all living beings in their hearts. If these three attributes are there, says Krishna to Arjuna, no matter how you worship the Divine, in spite of the fact that it is easier to do with Nama Rupa, I consider such a man to be a great Bhakta. Vyaha Bhakta Samebriya, I consider to be a great. 
So, <coughs> what I want to say today, it's 12 o'clock now, in one hour. So, what I want to say is, uh, this is a suggestion. Please uh, study the Upanishads, okay, fine. If you can't study the Upanishads, essence is there in the Gita. The Bhagavad Gita simplified for us, for you and me. Study the Gita. Gita itself says it is an Upanishad, essence of the Upanishad. Three, please study the Bhagavad, Srimad Bhagavad. The Bhagavad is not a collection of short stories. It is something which through stories brings out the wisdom of the Upanishads. Every now and then, where do we ask passes and says, the Supreme Brahman is in your heart, understanding that is your dharma, and then proceeds to the next story. So you see, and it's done in such beautiful stories, in such ways that you are attracted to it. Who doesn't want to read Harry Potter? I mean, if you're young. I must tell you, before I wind up, a story of how Vyasa wrote the Bhagavatam, you know. It seems after having done all the Vedas, compiled the Vedas, written the Puranas and the Itihasas, uh, he was uh, walking along the, uh, sitting in, on the banks of the river and sitting little glum after having written the Brahma Sutras. Now the Brahma Sutras are the highest level of Vedanta that one can study. Not everybody's cup of tea. Imagine a, text that starts with Atato Brahma Jijnasa, here begins the knowledge of the Brahman. So it's not everybody's cup of tea, but tough. After having done that, Vyasa was sitting beside the river glum, with a glum face, and Narada is supposed to have come. You know, Narada appears in such form. If you're all peaceful, he'll appear with the Veena and say, hey, do you know that fellow said this about you? Narayana, Narayana, disappear. So you get, so, Somebody has to churn, right? So anyway, so Narada comes and looks at Vyasa and says, Hey, your face looks very serious. You're glum. What's happened to you? You have written the Brahma Sutra, which is the ultimate moksha. He says, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> My heart seems to have become dysfunctional. So Narada says, I have a suggestion. To bring back your heart. Write the stories of the Lord from Matsya Avatara to the Krishna Avatara. You write this and see in the adventures that happen, your heart will come back to normal. And then Vyasa begins to write the Srimad Bhagavatam, starting with the different Avataras and their games and plays. And then, of course, what happens is when people read the Bhagavad, they go directly to the 10th canto and see Krishna in Vrindavan. <laughs> There is much before and there is much after. When you say Bhagavat, read everything. Don't read only the... Uh, and please remember that Krishna was 12 years old in Vrindavan when the Leelas took place. Don't misunderstand. Okay. So, this is what I wanted to tell you. Just to throw some seeds which might sprout at some point and go which is the job that I do. Thank you very much. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat. What was Maheshwarnath Babaji's instruction about cooking food? You mentioned in the book about... <laughs> yeah. You know, this is very interesting that you asked me. I could take five minutes, okay? We'll give time for another question. Well, when I went, left home at the age of 19, I had not entered a kitchen ever. In my house, everybody cooked and brought the food and said, eat, eat, and I don't want to. You know, that kind of system. And I didn't know, to, my father did not know how to make a cup of tea. At least I knew how to make a cup of tea. This is the way I went and landed to the Mysore Babaji. There was no kitchen, there was no, he said, cook your own food. Okay. So I used to go down and get some provisions. All I had to do to go to the provision shop down in uh, Badri and say this is for Babaji. That I used to get everything, some vegetables, bring back. 
he said something which was very interesting and which has been with my life throughout whatever you do he said do it with complete attention properly and patiently what will happen if you put the rice in the cooker and take it out before three whistles you know we didn't have a cooker i'm just saying so um and if i cut vegetables he would look at it and he would say some are big and some are small make it the same size i thought is this the way to learn upanishad he said you can't cut your vegetables properly what upanishad are you going to learn second he said eat food where you do not injure other any animals eat simple food eat clean food and don't over eat and don't starve yourself these are some of the principles that baba ji taught me even in cooking he had he was a strict teacher i think some of us may not last with him for a week i lasted for years 3 years and uh, so remember that cooking is not just a lady's job men can also cook the best chefs in five star hotels are men right men are good cooks they are good cooks in fact i've seen uh, in all the ramkrishna i've also spent some time with the ramkrishna mission as a brahmachari all the cooks are men cooks and they all come from bihar the brahmin cooks who come from bihar they are called maharaj so first i thought maharaj means that means good cook so cooking writing gardening all these things if you do with complete attention they are equivalent to meditation and one thing remember that any food that you make first offer it to the supreme being who has given us the food to eat and then you eat it very important to know always be thankful there are people who don't get a meal that you get food to eat is a grace of god so always first offering should be there and then you eat according to the vaishnava sampradaya krishna's name well i have also spent time with gaudiya math so i know krishna's name and the food that is offered to krishna which is prasad or on an equal basis there no difference so never waste food you take only what you can eat don't waste it the prasad that is offered to you is not different from the name of the lord do you cook you do what do you cook dal biryani you know biryani <laughs> what kind of biryani <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> but i would prefer vegetable biryani <laughs>
it is kriya yoga he calls it kriya yoga the teaching so kriya is simply a technique now when we say kriya yoga i am talking about a particular technique that i have inherited or got from maheshwarnath baba ji who belongs to a certain lineage on one side he was a nath on the second side he was a disciple senior disciple of shri guru baba ji from whom kriya yoga has come down to us through lahiri mahashay yogananda paramahamsa and others so this is the practice that we do so what was your question so my question is if you are practicing kriya how do you come to know that you are on the right path and are you practicing are you practicing kriya yes so where did you get your kriya from uh, from sadguru i did shapa mahaputra when we say kriya yoga it comes from the lineage of Shri Guru Baba Ji, who Yogananda Paramahamsa referred to as Mahavatar Baba Ji, and this is the Kriya that we do. We don't know of any. There are, therefore, if you are doing the Kriya which comes from Yogoda Satsang of Yogananda Paramahamsa, or in 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 foreign countries it's called SRF, Self Realization Fellowship, then I can discuss this with you. the other which you are talking about i am not familiar with so i do not want to comment on something that i am not familiar with so i i cannot answer this question to you but however i can say one in general if you are practicing some technique which is taking you to the spiritual development this is all right because in yoga there are innumerable kriyas it's not just our kriya that is there i agree with you there are certain things that you have to watch am i becoming a better person to sarvatra samabuddhaya can i keep my gita can i keep my mind tranquil under all circumstances to do i live on love or hatred three and four when i sit down to meditate is it possible for me to go into deep meditation in a short time all these factors are there and if you are becoming a better person and not too self centered then whatever kriya or practicing you are moving forward if you find a fault in any of this either you are not applying yourself or you are doing i don't know what you are doing and so on and so i don't want to comment You get what I said. You know, you uh, mentioned about uh, Gayatri Mahamantra chanting, preferably silently. Now, um, what, what I've read is there are four types of vani, from Vaikari. um pashyanti madhyama and para for us humans what's possible when we actually chant this silently madhyama that's that's the level we can go provided we don't engage our uh, exactly back throat yeah, exactly it's only mental yes great thank you stay with that thank you because that's a very technical question you know why because most human beings are only on the level of madhyama practice so stay there when you are moving forward in your spiritual practice you will be able to go beyond it but at the moment stay with it do you anyway this is my just a question because a lot a lot of children are usually asked about their identity and things you mentioned and i think in the introduction it was also said that you actually were born into a muslim family <laughs> so what attracted you to sanatan dharma and by following that did you come across any controversial issues from anywhere else first of all it looks like you haven't read my autobiography 
there is a book called Apprentice to a Himalayan Master, a Yogi's Autobiography, which is available in English, originally written in English, uh, but it's very strange that the first translation was in Gujarati. <laughs> And it was launched by Narendra Bhai. He said, I am going to... Of course, he couldn't launch it because he went up to Delhi and became Prime Minister. So, he sent somebody else. Anyway, so... And then in Marathi, in Hindi, so whichever language you want, it's available. Today, it's available in all languages, including foreign languages. So, if you read that, you'll find that I've had a certain experience when I was very young. At the age of... Uh, eight and a half, nine. I was playing in the backyard of my house in Kerala, Trivandrum, when I suddenly saw under the jackfruit tree, you know what is a jackfruit tree? Under the jackfruit tree, there was a person standing there who I've never seen in my life. He had matted hair and he was tall and thin and no clothes except a small white cloth under the jackfruit tree and uh, he did this. So the normal reaction would be to run away, right? But I didn't run away, I went towards him and then he put his right hand on my head. Before that, he asked me a question which I thought was a silly question at that time. He said, Kuch yaad aya? He asked me. Do you remember anything? I said, remember what? Some stranger asking you, do you remember? I don't know, I can't remember anything. Theek hai, he said. Then he put his hand on my head. And he said, samay hone par sab theek ho jayega. That's exactly what I understood the Hindi because even though I was born and brought up in Kerala, we are settlers from the north. So we speak at home Urdu. So I understood what he said, Samay hone par sab thik ho jayega. I could not understand a word. But then he said, Vapas jau. So I turned and walked. This is at the age of nine. Since that time, something happened to me. Till then I was a normal child, then I became a nut. Put it this way. So, from that time, in the night, I used to wake up at midnight and Nobody had taught me meditation. I started meditating. I used to feel something happening in my navel. This is where it started. Fixed my attention there and it was so blissful that I used to be absorbed in this. It continued for some time, many years. I went to college. I didn't read much in the classroom text. Not a good lesson for young people. Uh, please, please don't follow me. Please read your textbooks. But I, <laughs> I used to read Swami Vivekananda. I, my whole thing changed after that. So by the time I was 18, 19, we were, um, we were not a very orthodox family anyway. My father also practiced asanas and all that. So when I reached the age of 19, I felt like I was in some cage and I wanted to get out of it. Like, you know how a caged bird must be feeling. Many years after that, when I saw any bird caged, I used to quietly open it and go away. I, I felt, you know, the cage was actually gold cage. So it was a golden cage. We had no financial problem. We were very happy. But a cage is a cage, right? Whether it is made of iron, copper, gold, it's a cage. I wanted to stretch my wings. So one day, without telling anyone, I ran away. This is what happened. Again, please don't follow my example. Uh, I suffered a lot. I ran away and then I went to the, the no Google, nothing then. Looked at railway guides somehow. And then I went to the Himalayas and walked a lot. I suffered a lot. And then finally I met my Swarnath Babaji. And the moment I met him, I realized that it is the same person who has touched my head. From then on my life changed. Of course, after I came, I wanted to stay in the Himalayas, actually. Not get caught up in the life. He told me to get out. He said, go, get married, stay in this world, do normal work. They teach when I give you the green signal, not before. 
So I came back. Now this is what happened. And uh, therefore, my mind was changed. Yeah, you asked me the second question. Yes, I had some problems when I came back. I had some negative problems did happen to me. In fact, at one time I was physically attacked. There were 38 stitches on my body. But I decided that I will not do anything against it. They said they will take it up in parliament. I said nothing. Even. They don't know what they are doing, so it's okay. But uh, Babaji is there with me, so I have survived. Every time they say, do you want security? I say no. Because that is a nice way to be visible, you know, a lot of gunmen. And, what do you do with that? Babaji is there. If he wants me to go, I will go. Mm. This is the story. Please read the autobiography. <laughs>
I see that there are some children coming here every Sunday. Yeah. My suggestion is they should also be taught a um, little bit more than just teaching the Gita by rote. So that they understand that there is a lot of substance in this and not they are not just rituals. This point has to be presented to them in some way. If you can do it, it will be good. I, I was more so um, putting that question towards me because I don't have children, I don't care about them right now. But it was more may so I, about the teenagers. May I point they, out yeah. that the subject that we are discussing is not some kind of a superstition or anything. This is a serious subject about one's own inner being. So it is good for everyone to understand this. So you should share these things with your, with the younger generation, with the teenagers, and make them understand that there are so many jewels also in your own culture. Because otherwise, if you don't provide them, they will naturally stray away to something else that gives them joy. Give them joy in this, not like a dry teaching. Don't tell the intellect, the thinking kids. Don't tell them, do this. You have to. Tell them, explain to them why you do this. The why is very important, otherwise they will not listen. And there are too many attractions in the world, especially in the West, not only in the West, also in India, where they can be caught up and then turn totally against it. So, it needs a lot of spade work. May I pose a quick follow-up to that, if I hmm? could? Just a quick follow-up to that. So, let's say somebody is bound by their logic, and they, they just see this as stories and superstition. And it's great, it could probably help you in practical life. But how can you go the step further? How can you perhaps understand it beyond that frame of logic? So this is where the Upanishads are very important. The study of the Upanishads will make them understand that it is, these are not mere stories, but there is some essence behind the stories. The stories are merely told to make you understand certain truths. So, this is uh, something you should be doing. So what we should do, I have, for instance, I have written a comp some translations. And they're basically my talks on the Upanishads. They're called Wisdom of the Rishis, Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. I think, and maybe they're not written in such a simple language, but if it can be simplified, and if, if youngsters can be made to read that, then they will begin to understand that there is an essence behind this whole thing. It's not just stories. Stories are also good because people learn faster through parables than through dry lectures. Hmm? Thank you. So are you interested? I, I do find myself bound by logic and I do want to go there beyond is, that. Please, none of these teachings are in any way against logic. They only explain to you how logic can change from time to time and that there are other inputs which can turn your logic in a different way. It's good to be logical. There's nothing wrong with it's being... It's restricting. I've realized that and I, I want to then... Break open and move forward. Good idea. Bamboli Sriam. Um, my question is regarding to the modern That's world. That's a nice greeting, Bamboli. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question is, in this modern world, most people are seeking experience rather than wisdom. So, when we are seeking experience, most of the truth is blurred. Is? Is blurred. We are not able blurred. to see through. Mm -hmm. And we are not able to get any teachings from it. So, is it wrong? to just seek experience without any element of knowledge or any, uh, having an element of um, thought that I should have some teachings from this experience or just, just to go without any thought and just experience without any thought and without any wisdom. I couldn't get it clearly, what your question. So, uh, what I see is in myself and my friends, and if we want to go somewhere, we mostly go with the thought of we want to we enjoy, we want to oh. experience that. But in that process, what we, are, what we fail to do is seek the truth or the ultimate um, wisdom from that specific experience. 
and we are just experiencing it just happiness okay that in that moment but we didn't it, um, get any wisdom from it or any teachings from it and is it okay or is it r not okay to just go without an element of thought uh, which says that you don't need any teachings from it and you just need to go and enjoy it may i put it in a way to you yep. back the ultimate experience which is called the spiritual experience is actually much more enjoyment than any enjoyment that you know of in this world. We we'll put it this way. The ultimate truth in Vedanta is called Satchitananda. Sat means the truth, which means that which doesn't change. Well, everything changes. Everything is impermanent, something that is permanent. Chit means consciousness. It is conscious, it's not a padhartha, it's not a physical thing, it's conscious. And the third is that it's ananda. So ananda means, what is ananda? Bliss. Happiness, bliss, experience of happiness. This is ananda, right? Except that this ananda they're talking about, is defined in the tantras, as an, uh, in Vedanta, as anantam ananda, that ananda that never ends, which is always there. So, if you understand this, then perhaps the experience that you are seeking in the outside world, you will begin to seek in the inner world. And through that seeking, you will, understand, you will also get wisdom, not just what you experience in the outside world. You enjoy and then that's all. You don't get any lesson out of it. You don't get any teaching out of it. But when the inner experience of ananda is felt through various factors, through meditation, through it, then you also begin to have a meaning to it. You're not just experiencing and forgetting about it. It becomes a permanent part of your being. So what the spiritual seeker seeks is also experience. It's not as if he's not speaking, seeking experience. He's seeking a permanent happiness, seeing that these little levels of happiness are bound to come and go. Is there something where I can anchor myself? This anchor is actually a spiritual seeking. Don't think that a person who is perceiving spiritual fulfillment is getting rid of all experiences. No. The highest of experiences experience of bliss happens in the spiritual field when you have touched that which is your true essence. So when you think on these lines you would also try to experiment here and see what happens. As you experience this then you will not have much interest in that. The mind always needs a substitute. It cannot suddenly become free of something unless something else is substituted. And the inner substitute is a permanent substitute. Huh? Um, which is not like the temporary substitutes that you get. I'll tell you why. There are lots of youngsters today who indulge in uh, drugs, who smoke cannabis, all that. What, why are they doing that? Because they are dissatisfied with the outside world and they are seeking some new experience. But what happens? In the process you get addicted to it and the brain suffers irreplaceable damage. I am saying the experience that you, one seeks with these external chemicals and narcotics and so that can be found within us without the help of any of these. And this is the practice of yoga. Real yoga. I'm not talking about just yoga, meaning standing on your head. That's one part of yoga. So when you begin to understand this, probably you'd like to experiment and figure out. You should discuss with your friends. Hey, there's another trip we can make. This is the yogic trip. Come on. Huh? <laughs> that we can't do. You don't have to go anywhere. You can be where you are and do it. I mean, you don't have to. Look, spiritual knowledge in India and spiritual experience in India is not always associated with sannyas. There are four kinds of 
practitioners, there are householders, there are brahmacharis. You see the ancient yogic uh, Vedic system says brahmacharya, grahastha ashrama, vanaprastha and sannyas. And according to the Gita, sannyas is not giving up work or stopping your things, it is giving up something with your mind, not a physical giving up. So, I think what has happened is the young, the, the teenagers especially, are not exposed to these teachings. So, some attempt should be made to make them understand, and probably they will understand it better in English than in any other language today. Which is why I do Bhagavad Saptahas in English. Bhagavad Saptahas are usually done in local language. How many people will come? Only those who are very traditional will come. I will do the Bhagavad Saptahas in English. Youngsters will come at least out of curiosity. What is this guy saying? Let's hear. And then once they come, they get hooked. This is also a hook. Cannabis is a hooker, this is also a hooker, but this is much more important and better than that. The mind cannot stay without some entertainment, right? So turn it into spiritual bliss. And please, if you think your parents will object to spiritual exploration, tell them, look, I will continue to wear jeans, I will continue to do whatever I am doing, only my mind is going. I am not changing my robes, I am not shaving my head, I am not becoming a son. No, it was just hypothetical. No, <laughs> parents won't be saying okay, so. Thank you. So, sir, I think we should now call it a day. Yeah.